check, 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 one, two. JavaScript brothers and sisters, can you hear me out there? Awesome. <laughs> Straw, stream processing for Node.js. So in the concept of stream processing, we have a topology of nodes. Each node receives some input, does some processing, passes on the result. As it turns out, this is a really fundamental concept in computing. Uh, the original definition of computer was one who computes, typically a semi-skilled individual who could only perform some basic arithmetic. So when a scientist had a problem they wanted to solve, they would set up a room full of these people, they'd break their problem down into small pieces, give each person a small step of the problem. They'd do their work, pass the result on to the next person at the next desk. So this is used to solve some fairly significant for the time problems. They cataloged tens of thousands of stars with it in the 1700s. Uh, they successfully predicted the return of Halley's Comet. Uh, closer to modern times, during the Great Depression, 450 out-of-work clerks and mathematicians were put to use on the Mathematical Tables project. This stupendous project produced 28 volumes of trig, table, uh, trig log tables, mathematical formulas, all sorts of computational resource. This provided a really powerful springboard to the United States after the end of the Second World War. M meanwhile, during the war, human computers were instrumental in the Allied defeat over Nazi Germany. Uh, at Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom, the codebreakers there used human computing to work on encoded German messages. They set it up as a series of huts. Each hut would be populated by highly skilled mathematicians. Fresh German intercepts would be passed into the first hut. They'd work on a small part of the problem, pass it on to the next hut. The advantages of this were twofold. First, the mathematicians in each hut could specialize on their task. Secondly, the compartmentalization of knowledge was restricted. This was essential to preserving security in the war effort. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, Dr. Richard Feynman, one of the greatest physicists who ever lived, was working on the atom bomb at the Manhattan Project. He also used compu uh, human computers to, to process the enormous amount of mathematics that was required to develop these weapons. Around this time, ENIAC, the first computer, was coming online. Now, Feynman did not believe that ENIAC could surpass humans, so he squared off his computing team against ENIAC. For two days, they battled it out. The humans were winning. At that point, the humans had to sleep. From that point on, <laughs> humans would never again surpass computers. So during the Dark Ages, the baby boomers solved most of the hard problems in this space. There was a huge amount of research done at IBM, and this chap, John Paul Morrison, effectively wrote the book on the topic. Uh, he produced a system that was employed at a bank in Canada in the mid-70s. This system is still in production today. Go and meditate on that. 40 years continuous production. So right now, we have a veritable Cambrian explosion of systems using this type of computation. Kestrel provides the backbone for Twitter. Kafka does similar work at LinkedIn. Uh, the ACCA framework built on top of Scala uses these concepts. And the, the, Erl the Erlang language itself is really built around these ideas. So to recap, stream processing. You have a topology of nodes. Your nodes are connected together with pipes. Each node works in a small part of the problem, passes its results on to the next one in the chain. This is how you solve your problem. If we have a look at ENIAC again, ENIAC, the first computer. ENIAC, ENIAC is actually a stream processing system. You can see here it's made up of a number of panels. So these vertical panels are each nodes in ENIAC. They perform one function each. It might be an addition unit, an accumulator, uh, a square root module. There were about 30 different modules they had. To program ENIAC, you connect it together with wires. So if you see these women here, they are actually programming ENIAC. These are some of the first programmers ever. Over her arms, she has a set of wires. She is using these to connect the modules together. The way ENIAC would work is it would have a punch card reader at one end. That would read data in and feed it through the processing topology. At the other end, there would be a punch card writer that would punch out the results. So when he was developing his nuclear weapons, Feynman would put runs through this of about a million punch cards in one session. This is Max MSP. It's a modern flow-based programming environment. It's our audio, uh, audio visual media programming environment. So in Max, you have a set of objects. Each object has one or more inputs and one or more outputs. To program Max, 
you connect these objects together with wires. This system can handle MIDI data, uh, full quality audio, full frame video. It's a really rich and deep environment for programming AV installations. It uses exactly the same paradigm as any acted. So why do we do this? Why do we want to program in this way? First of all, it makes it really easy to reason about your problem. You can break it into small discrete steps. Each of those steps becomes easier to program. It's also great for real-time data. If your nodes operate asynchronously, they just sit there waiting for some input before they do anything. This, this is a natural fit for real-time processing. The other benefit is it's scalable. So if you have a node in your topology that's a hotspot, it's working harder than the other ones. You can simply clone it, spread the same data across the two copies of the same node with some kind of load balancing, and you've reduced the heat of that area in your code. After that, you can recombine the data and send it further down the topology. So I want to do this myself. Meet Straw. Straw is a real-time processing framework for Node.js. It's on NPM. You can install it. In fact, you should install it. It works just like any other uh, NPM module. I find a really good way to introduce Straw is through a Hello World application. This app is made up of three nodes. These nodes are connected together with two wires. Uh, data flows from left to right in this picture. You can't really see the arrows here very well. So the ping node, that periodically generates an output. Count, it simply counts how many inputs it receives. And every time it receives a, an input, it sends that total through its output. Print, just prints out whatever message it receives uh, to your standard out. So if I was going to write Hello World, I'd set up a file structure something like this. Topology.js is your entry point. There's a file for each of your nodes, and there's the node modules folder where NPM is going to put its stuff. Can everyone see that OK? Yes? No? Yep. So in topology.js, you're going to have something like this. This is how we define a new topology. We require the module. We instantiate our topology, and we pass it in an object that describes all the nodes we want. Uh, for each node, we say which file it uses and what its inputs and outputs are. Having a closer look at one of these, this is the ping node. It's the first one in our chain. So it's in a file called ping.js, and it sends its stuff through an output called ping out. In the ping file itself, uh, we have a structure something like this. If you use Backbone, this might be familiar. It, it, it is roughly built on the same principles. Uh, we extend a prototype node. We override some functions. We write some of our own. The key one in ping is the run function. When the topology is instantiated, run gets called. That starts our operation off. For this one, it just sets an interval timer that periodically calls our ping function. That outputs the current date time. The count module is a whole lot simpler. So it receives input from ping. It sends its output through a channel called count out. Inside it, we have something like this. Whenever it receives a message, it's going to process it. All it does is bump up a total and output that total. And finally, we have print. It receives its output from count. Uh, it's much simpler, even. It just receives some input and prints it out to the console. So if we're going to run our Hello World, it looks something like this. Node topology.js, you see some booting up action happen. Every node starts. It tells us it's fi finished starting up. When we get to the bottom, you see ping print, uh, print putting out some results. So we have a process going on, ping count print, ping count print, ping count print. That's what our topology is doing. So if you want to start playing with straw, um, the best thing to do is have a look in the examples folder in the, in the code base. There are a bunch of different ways you can configure your topologies. There are lots of different models for doing it. And there are a whole lot of things I'm not going to talk about today that it can do. Uh, once you're familiar with that, you design a topology to solve your particular problem. Uh, write some nodes, straw takes care of the rest. When you write your nodes, there are only really two things you need to be worrying about at its core. One is you have to process incoming messages. So you override a base function, do some processing, and there's a callback to call when you're finished. If you want to output some data, it's just this dot output. Straw takes care of where these messages go and where they come from. So this is a bit more of a substantial uh, application built using straw. Uh, who knows about the Twitter firehose? Hands up. Everyone heard of that? Like three people? OK. So Twitter provides what's called the Twitter firehose. You can uh, access this just through a HTTP request, and it'll stream down a percentage of all the tweets that go through the system. So you get basically a flood of tweets coming down your connection. 
uh, what you get is about 1% of the actual tweets. So these, these, this data that comes down is like a JavaScript object for each tweet. In that, it has a whole bunch of metadata about the tweet, who, who it's from, the message of the tweet, the time it was sent, the geolocation, the language the tweet was in, and a whole bunch of other stuff. What this app does is subscribe to that and try and display that information on the screen in real time. So you can see in the middle, it's a bit hard to see, but that's a, a map of the Earth with geolocated tweets showing up on it. To the right, we have the top 20 trending hashtags and the count of those hashtags that we've seen. Down the left, you have a histogram of the languages that have been seen in the tweets. If I was going to build this, I'd construct it something like this. At the very front, we have a consumer for the fire hose, so we connect to it, we start receiving the tweets. For each tweet we get in, we're going to break it apart. We're going to route bits of that tweet to different sub-processing units. One of them is going to take the geolocation. All we need to do with that is send it straight onto our front end. Uh, for the language, we're going to take counts of the languages we see. Now, what we don't want to do is every time we see a tweet, update our count of languages on the front end. Because if we're processing 10,000 tweets a second, it's just going to swamp all our web browsers out there. So what we do is maintain a running count on the server, and, every, and periodically, once a second or so, push that actual count to the front end. With the hashtags, it's a little bit more involved, but not much. We take the text of the tweet, we strip out the hashtags, and we pass those on to another node. That node then does a count very similar to how we do languages. It maintains a running total and outputs the top 20 to the front end. Uh, our front end itself is served up through Express. So we have a topology running, we have an Express server running. They're actually completely independent. Uh, Express provides a socket I.O. connection to the browser. Does everyone know what socket I.O. is? It basically provides your real-time communication between your web server and your client. So you can push data to your, to your browser. Uh, now the problem we have is the topology is running completely independent from the web server. What we need is a way of communicating um, our data from that topology to the client who's accessing the web server. So luckily, Straw provides us a method for doing that. What we can do is use what's called a tap. So in our topology, we provide an output from a node that is going nowhere. Then independently, we tap into that from our web server. That receives all the messages that that node's outputting. So we do this for the geolocation, for the languages, uh, and for the hashtags. In our server, in the Express server, we have something like this. We create a tap. Um, we say we want to receive messages from client geo, which is the name of the pipe. Uh, and every time a message comes in, we have an event handler for that. All that event handler does is push it to the client over socket.io. On our web browser, so this is on the client side JavaScript code, you're doing something like this. We simply uh, bind to socket.io, look for a message that's been tagged to geo, and when we get the data in, we're just going to paint it onto the screen, onto our map. So there you have Haystack looking something like this. You have three sections to it. There's three separate branches of messaging that are coming from straw through your Express server to the client. There's a map with geolocated tweets. Now, if you see this in real time, you actually see them pinging in as the tweets happen. That looks really cool. And if you leave it for a day, you end up with a map of the world in, world in red where the tweets have been. Uh, down the bottom left, you have a histogram of the languages and our trending tweets. All of these update in real time. So if you want to play with this, uh, it's on my GitHub repo. Clone it. Install some dependencies. You will have to go to Twitter and register it as an application. You need to get OAuth keys from Twitter to actually access the Firehose. Once it's done, you need two separate terminals. You run the topology in one, you run the web server in the other, and then you can just surf to it locally. So we're going to take a bit of a deep dive into how Straw actually gets its job done. Um, Straw only really has one hard dependency. That is Redis. Who, who knows about Redis? Yeah, good. More people should learn about Redis, because it, it is super awesome. Redis, Redis is a key value database. So what that means is that on my server side, if I want to store some data, I say, for this key, save me a value. Redis will take care of it. But it's lightning fast. So it pretty much stores it all in memory. Um, so you're going to have to install Redis first. Once you've done that, clone the repo and install the dependencies. Inside Straw itself, we have four files that really matter. These are in the lib folder. There is index.js there, but that's just provided as an endpoint for our node's require system. Topology.js is where the main work happens. Uh, you have a, a node prototype that you can extend. 
and then run and run it where the magic happens for actually operating the nodes. Um, so if we have a look at the topology, can I make this bigger? No. It looks something like this. Sorry, I don't have a copy of this on my screen, so I have to keep referring to my notes. Um, you create a topology. Into that topology, you pass a JSON object describing the nodes you want. Straw iterates through that and creates a, creates a runner for each node. That runner forks the child process. So a child process is a completely independent Unix environment for that node. It has its own memory space, its, its own everything. Inside that, you have a, a separate instance of node.js running. We run a piece of code there called run.js. That sets up communication with Redis. It loads in your node file and instantiates your object. Now, this own process business. We run our nodes in their own process. There are a few reasons for this. First of all, it makes it really easy to restart nodes. So if something crashes uh, or we want to change our code, we can just kill a process and start it up again. Um, if you've tried hot reloading code with nodes require system, it's really hard, and I think you have to get a bit hacky to do that. So when you're developing a straw, you can work on a node, save the file, it'll auto-reload it for you. Um, we implement that using child process. The other advantage is a crash doesn't take everything down. If your, if your node crashes, that process has crashed, we receive a message, and we can just restart it. It, it means you're not going to bring the whole system down by one bad bit of code. But I think the biggest advantage is that JavaScript runs in one thread. That means you are bound to one CPU core. Now, most of us, I think all of us now, have more than one core on our machines. That means we're wasting most of our computing resource. So by running these nodes in their own process, you distribute this load across all the cores in your machine. Um, it also means, hypothetically, you could be running your nodes on separate machines, using Redis as a communication infrastructure between them. So we'll dive into some code. We're going to walk through uh, creating a topology and see how it actually does it. So we're just going to look at one node. Normally, you'd be passing in a whole set of them. We're going to look at our count node. It's in a file called count.js that has an input and an output. When the topology first starts up, it iterates through this object. It creates a runner for each node. Into that runner, it passes a definition, which is a bit of object we saw on the previous slide, and some, ops, some options. These options contain globals like, uh, where is my Redis instance for me to communicate with? This is shared by all, in, all, all the nodes. Inside that runner.js uh, function, we fork a child process. So, this effectively runs run.js in the command line in a separate process. So what you're seeing here is the absolute pass to that file, because it's not inheriting your environment variables. It doesn't know where the file is relative to your code. You tell it exactly where it is. Then in the array down the bottom, you see the command line parameters that, that get passed into that file when you run it. Once it's been forked, we've only got one way of communicating with this process. We can bind a, an, event an event handler to it to capture messages it sends us, or we can send it messages directly. We use this for some very minimal communication. We say, have you crashed? Send us a message. Uh, you need to terminate yourself. That's about the only level of communication we have with the process once it's running. Inside this child process, we parse the command line arguments. We require your file in. We tell your file to start itself up. And when it has, it sends an, uh, it triggers the callback. Once that callback's fired to our parent process, we send a message to say we've initialized. That means that node in the topology is up and running. So the key bit of magic here, though, is Redis. The nodes can't communicate with each other through the regular JavaScript environment. The only way they talk is through Redis. This run process handles all the communication with Redis. The node itself knows nothing of it. All it knows is, I receive a message, I've got to process it, or I can send some output and you're going to deal with it somehow. It doesn't even know where it's going to go. So run sets up communication with Redis. We use a feature of Redis called Redis lists. So as its base data type, Redis basically stores strings. But it has another, uh, a bunch of other data types. One really awesome one it has is lists. So with a list, you can store a list of values. You can push values into one end, pull them off the other end or the other way around. So you can use a list as a stack or a queue. We use Redis lists as a queue. This is an analog of the pipes we have passing data along. We push messages in, 
we pull them off the other end. So resources base command for dealing with lists is actually not too much use for us, because if I want to get a piece of data off the other end of the list, I ask Redis, and it's going to say, here's some data. If there's nothing waiting for me there, it's going to say, sorry, no data, see you later. I'm going to have to keep polling Redis to get that data. But there's a feature there that's really useful for us called uh, blocking pops. The way this works is I ask Redis for some data, and if it doesn't have any, it won't come back to me until it does. So I say, Redis, you got some data, and finally it'll say, here's your data. The node can go and process it. We get something for free out of this that's really useful. It's basically how we do the load balancing on the nodes. So if you have two individual nodes, they both queue up to get data from that pipe. When the message comes for the first node, it's going to run away and process it. The second node will be front of the queue. This guy will process his data, come back and join the back of the queue. So we get the free load balancing by just using basic Redis commands. If we have a look at how this is implemented, uh, so the self.brpop function is really the main event loop of the node. It connects to Redis. Uh, we tell Redis to brpop. The self.l keys are the list of pipes we want to subscribe to. So actually, a node can listen to multiple pipes. It can have multiple inputs. Um, then there's a callback function that gets triggered when a message arrives. We process that with a node, and we go back to brpop again. So we have an infinite loop here that's just pulling messages off the end of the pipe. So conversely, when we want to push the message onto the pipe, we have an event handler that listens to our node. When the node outputs a message, uh, this handler gets called. It pushes the message onto the left-hand side of our pipe, or our Redis list. Now, Redis uh, has a great little utility called Redis CLI. That lets us interact directly with Redis. Um, one useful little command in there is monitor. It shows you all the commands that go through Redis in real time. What you can see here is a brief trace of the Hello World app uh, and what goes on inside Redis. Uh, it pushes some data onto the left of the pipe, and then the, the count node is popping it off the other end. So that's what it looks like. There's one other thing. You see it goes BR pop, stropping out one. These block and pops actually do have a timeout. So you say, I'm going to block for one second. If you have nothing for me, give me my control back, because uh, they do actually block your JavaScript process. So I'm using Straw in the real world. One of my clients uh, is the market sponsor of Australian electricity futures and options data. We get a data feed from a provider in the States. Uh, effectively, this is just a, a raw socket that we connect to and receive a flood of messages down. These messages come in a proprietary format. So we have a node that connects to the socket, takes these messages, changes them into a format we can use. That's the parser node there. Then they go into a sanitizer node. That dumps everything we don't need. We actually receive the complete market picture of all the futures and options. We only really need 1% of this. So everything we don't need, we throw away. After the sanitizer step, it goes into what I call catcher, which basically puts it into a database. There's actually a whole bunch of post-processing that happens after that, but it's not really relevant to what I'm showing you here. So the big problem with this data provider is that we can only have one connection to the socket, which is not useful to me, because I've got to have a staging and a production environment. I cannot be developing on my production environment. The way around this is I have two identical topologies running, one in production, one in staging. After the sanitizer, I just dump a log of all the data I got down to a text file. Then in my staging environment, I tail that file over SSH, feed it into the identical topology. So after the sanitizer stage, everything in that topo is the same. I can work on it, I can change it, I can break it, do whatever I want without affecting my production environment. So this is a couple of screenshots of the system actually running. Down the left, you see a log. Uh, of straws output. This ticks along at about one message a second. Sometimes we get floods of data coming through, and there might be thousands of them there. But generally, during, during run of market, it's a message a second or so. This is a little app I wrote to actually monitor what goes on in the pipes. So the number you can see in the column in the middle is the buildup of messages in any given pipe. The, the way this data works is it's kind of peaky. We get a flood of data through, and then it'll trickle for a while, then we get another flood of data through. So this is a fairly normal operation. But using this, I can see maybe where the code's inefficient, where I've got hotspots, where things are broken. If messages back up to 30,000 or so, 
I know I've got a problem with one of my nodes. This is actually me debugging the system. I missed a callback somewhere, and I was getting exactly that. I'd get a massive amount piling up on one pipe, and node had just crashed because it ran out of memory. Actually, Redis had crashed because it ran out of memory. Down at the bottom, I have some straight Redis counts. That's a, a count of the messages through the day. So over the day, it's, this is nearly the end of the day. It's a couple of million messages there. Straw also gives you out-of-the-box support for StatsD. So StatsD is a, a fairly useful um, bit of monitoring software. What, what you can do with it is just send it counts of events that happen. So in Straw, every time a message goes through a pipe, it sends a count to StatsD. What you're seeing here is the counts of the electricity futures. So the, the purple background is the, tip, is, is the data coming direct from the feed. The yellow one are the messages coming in the intraday cycle. Down the bottom is actually the useful information. So you see it's thinning out as it gets further down the chain. This is a bit more of a detailed breakdown of the same thing. Um, I hope you can see that. Up the top left, we have what's called a heartbeat. So the data, providers gives us a, the data provider gives us a heartbeat message once a second. We feed that through the topology and um, use that in our monitoring as well. These other charts, you see this peaky action going on. Every 15 minutes or so, they send us a complete market picture. So we get the price of every commodity on the market. What looks like the noise floor on these charts is actually the useful data. This is the bids, the offers, the actual trades going through the system. But what I found really interesting is the blue one here, kind of in the middle right, you can see a big hole from about midday to about 2.30. This is when the brokers have lunch at the pub. <laughs> so to sum it up, stream processing. We have a topology of nodes. They're connected together with pipes. Each node processes a small part of the problem. Um, kind of to wrap it up, please jump in and start using Straw. It's on GitHub. Uh, contribute some code. There are a fair few things that can be done to it. But what I really want you to do is, I think this is a, a really emerging idea uh, in the technology industry at the moment. Straw is a toy. It'll help you get started. It might help you solve some real world problems. But there are some really industrial strength systems out there that are, are great at doing this stuff. After you've had a play with Straw, I'd encourage you to explore and see what suits your particular problem. Uh, Straw, stream processing for Node.js. Thank you. Hi, this is really cool. I, um, I think that you said the master process is just a single process and the other, like each node can be distributed, multiple Correct. processes. Yeah. Have you given any thought to how you would distribute the master, the master node and have like multiple masters? So if one goes down, it doesn't take down the whole thing? I have, but not deep thought. It's a tough problem, that one. In fact, to, to be honest, straw is my version one, and I'm working on some other stuff at the moment that will hopefully replace it. And, and that is one of the problems to solve. Thank you. Yeah, really interesting. I was reading about no flow JS, which, yeah. is, which is, I think, kind of uh, flow processing, but probably is under, still in a single process. Um, my question is, uh, how do you manage like multiple, if you like multiple workers? Uh, Sorry, say again, please. How, how do you manage if you like like multiple workers for probably each node, or is each node just a worker, just a process? How do I manage the child processes? Yes. Uh, do you manage like the the number of processes for the nodes? Yeah, yeah. There's one process per node. Okay. So it doesn't do any kind of. It doesn't stop you doing anything silly. It's okay. up to you to design the topology so that it's going to work right. But I think Node.js itself will choose which CPU those processes end up on. You can't really say run this one on that core or this one on that core. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, you know, in, in certain um, situations where pr probably it's more data intensive and it requires probably you, you would like to, because it's process on Node.js is still to runs on a single track. So if you like to have like more, uh, more workers, uh, more processors to, to process a particular process, um, is there this capability to do so? I'm not sure. Um, right, each, <laughs> if the, each of those nodes has its own thread that's running in an independent process. So it's up to the underlying operating system to manage that. OK, and, and this has worked pretty well for you? 
So, sorry? Uh, th this has worked pretty well. Ab absolutely, it works, it works well. Okay. Yeah. But with a multi-core machine, I mean, th this is like, you can see it in the web browser. If you have some JavaScript that's too busy, it's going to block your UI interaction because it's got one thread that handles everything. It's the same thing on the server. So if one of those nodes is doing some heavy processing, because it needs to, if they were running in the same process, it's going to starve out the other ones for CPU time or for time on that thread. Whereas if they're in independent threads, the CPU is going to schedule so that they're not blocking each other. So you, you spoke about uh, hot code reloading. Hot. Yeah. So do you just like just take down the process, or do you? Exactly. Well, the, e, e, each in the, in the node prototype, there, there, there are a couple of methods. There's one called start and one called stop, or run and stop. So when I detect a change in the file, we, what, you can watch the file for changes. It'll tell that process, it'll tell the node to stop. The node will give a callback when it's successfully stopped. It'll take down the child process, and then it'll spin another one up. But by doing that, it's reloading the file off disk to get the fresh code. Okay, so, so it has to be done through the master. The master takes care of that, yeah. So if it the, crashes, then? If it crashes, it's the same thing. Um, it's worth having a look at the, the child process docs on Node.js, but there are a bunch of messages you can bind to from that. One of them will tell you if the process exited and what exit code it gave you when it did it. So you use that to say, well, my process has just terminated itself. I better start up another copy. Thank you. There is a chance of message loss with this. It's not in any way perfect. If that node was processing a message and it crashes, that message is gone. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Uh, in your cases, have you met the condition where when you have to scale the straw? Not yet. Not yet. Um, I've got some ideas for how to do it. And the, if, the first thing you. But if you have to scale it, how do you do it? There are two approaches. The first is the cheap one, where you're using the same computer. And in your topology, you have a node that's hot. You make a copy of that node. So I might have um, process one and process two. But they're both listening to the same source. So Redis will take care of load balancing the messages between them. Hopefully, they'll end up on different CPUs, so they're not contending for resource. Um, you can add as many as you want. You could have 10 of them. And I think the examples actually have one of this in there. Um, the load will get balanced across them. So that's the first way. The second way is you'd actually run a different computer with a copy or part of the topology, but connecting to the same Redis. So you output a message here, and just by virtue of naming the pipes correctly, this one will receive the messages from the other computer. But, but again, it's not going to, you're not going to run Twitter on this thing, right? It's good for, for small stuff, and it's good for learning. Yeah.